In this case, it's a, a comment on the uh, koan, case 54, in, um, in the Blue Cliff record. Um, <clears throat> and I was, you know, in our discussion before the break, I was highlighting that, um, uh, that the uh, author Schwedo does not complete the poem, and he says, I leave out the last part, and we talked about how this meant that, you know, it's, it's in the eyes of the holder, or everybody's got to come to their so, same conclusion, and, you know, I think this is an influence on, um, on Dogen's attitude in, in a lot of his uh, discourse, whether it's prose or poetry, uh, and, and uh, others and teachers as well. But um, it looks a little out of context to say, um, don't you realize how impregnable the position was? So these, the poems in the Blue Cliff Record are designed to be comments directly on the, um, on the case, on the stories. And in the story, Yun Men, who was a famous uh, teacher, and you know, we discussed that whole issue of, of people seeking out the, the famous recluses. Um, uh, so, Starts out as a pretty typical story that, uh, and you can, you know, you can read translations of it uh, in case 54. So um, where a monk comes, <coughs> comes to him and typically the uh, master receiving a new monk would say, well, where did you come from? And, you know, that question is a challenge that ideally would reveal the true um, reality of the, of the person being questioned and they would be able to incorporate them into their answer something uh, dynamic about their state of realization. Uh, but often is the case that they don't um, seem to respond to the challenge and, uh, and they just give a kind of matter of fact or literal answer. So in this case, the monk says, well, I came from, you know, such and such a teacher. Uh, that teacher that he came from is not, is not well known, or at least it, the way the history unfolded. Okay, so that's, that's a context. And so um, in their dialogue, uh, Yun Men slaps, the slaps that um, student twice because he asked, well, what did the teacher teach you? And the, and the student held out his hands and then he, um, he slapped the student. <laughs> and, then, and then Yun Men held out his hands and the, and, the, and the student doesn't respond appropriately. So he slaps him again. And uh, the way it's usually interpreted is that the student, now this is, I think, an important point that, that does dovetail with Dogen. It's actually not a point that I um, had to plan to make so much in, in our workshop today because it deals more with koans, but it is, it is related to his, his view of discourse. Um, so what happens in that, in that poem is that the, uh, these poems are generally designed to praise the master, praise the teacher, praise the one who has the wisdom and uh, kind of expose the ignorance or attachment or lack of understanding of the disciple. It falls into that pattern. You see a lot of, a lot of cases like that. But what the poet seems to be saying to Yun Man was, hey, this student actually had a very good position. And the fact that you slept, slapped him twice shows that you missed the boat. Now they don't usually criticize the teacher, but they are willing to do that in some cases. Now we don't know if it's kind of tongue in cheek or not, but one of the implications, uh, you know, one way this gets interpreted is like, why did you slap him twice? Uh, you know, once would have been enough make your point so you weren't original the second time and therefore you can't blame uh, the student. So what he's saying to uh, Yun Men is uh, don't you realize that the position of the disciple was kind of invincible or was, was solid and that gives it a little bit of a different twist and then the reason that I connect that with Dogen is because in, you know very frequently or I think a, a very important theme, and this would be, you know, for another uh, detailed discussion and to show more examples of his interpretation of koans. But I think the one thing that Dogen tries to get into uh, very frequently is the idea that um, both master and disciple are leading each other to enlightenment and the apparently 
ignorant or attached disciple is not necessarily a, you know, defeated or bested or, a, you know, a loser in some kind of dharmic contest, the way it's often portrayed. And that, um, and so by um, this commentator, Shwedo, questioning Unmen here, it's a little bit similar to what would happen in, um, you know, it, it was, you can see that this would become an influence on Dogen's approach. But um, before I get started with a few other uh, poems, uh, was there any other comments or thoughts or questions coming out of the break period? Anything anybody comment or ask? <clears throat> okay, well, let's go to, um, let's go back to page two. Or was this page two? <laughs> um, what page was that? Okay, uh, let's see. The one I want to get to is, um, maybe it's on page three, sorry. Okay, so <clears throat> this does show a little bit about um, uh, a poetic example uh, of, of the uh, relationship between Dogen and his predecessors, who he often cites um, and but often um, takes them to task, uh, rewrites them, what they say, uh, challenges them. And that sometimes includes uh, Rougin. And I think you especially see this in the um, Ehe Koloku, the, the wonderfully translated as uh, Dogen's extensive record by uh, Taigen Leighton and Shohaku Okamura. Um, although I, I, this version may be a little bit different, but then if you check the, uh, their book, but um, if, you, if you read their, the book, the, there's many, many examples where Dogen has um, challenged one of his predecessors, um, including, you know, Rujing and other Soto uh, teachers. Um, so that, in a way, the challenge is a form of praise. I mean, one of the things I think that's true in the Asian, in the East Asian literary tradition and religious tradition, and you see this in both the literature and we talked about the poetry contest and you see this in the, in the uh, Zen encounters is that um, you don't stand pat on, a, on any kind of fixed position. So um, uh, a, a main example is the uh, Dogen's extensive record. If you look at the um, Jodo or the Dharma discourse of the sermon, number uh, 179, I don't have that one here, but if you look at 179, very, it's very, very similar to the fascicle Tenbo Lin in Shobo Genzo, Turning the Dharma Wheel, where he mentions that Ru Jing cites a passage attributed to Shakyamuni from one of the sutras, and then he mentions several other masters um, who've interpreted it, and Ru Jing said, well, none of them are right, here's my view. And then Dogen comes along and says, um, uh, well, uh, I agree, none of them are right, and uh, Ruxing wasn't right either, and here's my view. And so th this is a very common theme, and sometimes it's more direct, and sometimes it's a little more subtle. Um, and what, what he sometimes does, and in this case in number 355, is that he'll cite uh, a Chinese teacher's uh, a poem and then rewrite it a little bit. Now, once again, on the rewriting process, what happens is that um, the, the greatness of a new poem is, you know, not necessarily its originality, but its dependence with uh, an inventive flavor on a previous poem. So the more you can um, emulate a previous poem and while changing it subtly, uh, the, the better that is. So you don't want to, you know, nobody's expecting you to start out fresh. Of course, there are many good examples where you, you do have a fresh take on something or you do, you do start out with a new set of imagery. But going back to somebody else's image and then changing it. Now, in Japanese poetic tradition, this, uh, there's a term called elusive variation. I, uh, that term is not used in Zen, but I think 
it would it does apply to Zen, and I and in my mind it it perfectly is suited to what happens in Zen, elusive variation. So you you allude to a previous poem or you cite a previous poem, and you have your own variation on it, and um, the greatness of your variation is partly a reflection of the greatness of the original poem and partly uh, uh, a reflection on your ingenuity in um, changing it a little bit. So let's take uh, these two examples. One is by Master Longya, and then the other is Dogen's um, re rewriting of it. Um, Okay, so uh, would anybody like to read the uh, the first poem, Study the Way? I'm happy to. Okay, thank you. S study the way like rubbing sticks together to make fire. When smoke arises, do not stop. Just wait until the golden star appears returning home is arriving at your destination. All right, thank you. So before we go to Dogen's version, let, any thoughts on this? What, what would the rubbing sticks together symbolize? Practice. Practice and yeah. to make, you know, to make something happen. And right. I think, um, and actually, uh, I think you talked about this in the, the, uh, uh, that summer event, like the practice, the, the interaction between the teacher and the, and the student is the, right. the rubbing together kind of to, you know, mm -hmm. make that spark fly. Um, right. and so once the spark, uh, comes out on line two, you know, keep going, don't, you know, you, uh, don't stop. And that's, that's, um, you know, that's a theme that Dogen would like in that you continue. Um, and um, how about in the last two lines? What is the golden star? Um, is that a question or a statement? <laughs> that's a question. Okay. Uh, golden star is what the, uh, the Buddha saw um, at the moment of his awakening. Ah, and returning home is uh, arriving at your destination is is seeing yourself as a whole okay seeing it you know the self-realization coming you know right. taking the step back to shine the light seeing seeing the true self all right so um So uh, Dogen makes the comment, well, you know, Master Longya is very famous. He started his own lineage. Uh, he's, he was the founding ancestor of our lineage. I'm sorry. He was a founding uh, ancestor of our lineage. Uh, can his virtue be measured? There's not much choice in the matter that I make another verse using his closing uh, rhyme. Um, so Dogen says, well, um, you know, I'm going to have to, you know, restate this in my own way, but, um, they, you know, I'm going to follow his pattern. So I'm going to follow his imagery. I'm going to use some of his exact wording and I'm going to follow the rhyme scheme and the tonal patterns and all those intricate rhetorical devices that are too complicated <laughs> to try to work into any kind of translation to reflect it all. Um, but, um, but, but we know are embedded in there and that's part of, that's part of what, um, Dogen would have learned to do when he was in China and, and succeeded that. You know, one thing that intrigues me about Dogen's, um, poems written in the Chinese style is that when he went to China and it was there for four years, we, and, you know, and obviously practiced Zazan attained, um, casting off or dropping body and mind and, uh, met, uh, intimately with uh, Ru Jing on many occasions, and those dialogues were recorded in the, in the Hokioki record, and, and so many things that Dogen accomplished. And reading vast amounts of the Chinese materials and studying it and memorizing it or bringing manuscripts back with him, I mean, we don't know exactly what his, um, 
you know, entourage of travelers would have been like, and to, to what extent he could have brought back such, uh, such a number of manuscripts that he, it seems like he must have possessed because he cites them when he's back in Japan verbatim, and how would he have known them? But maybe others had brought them back. Um, there is a, there is a, uh, um, uh, a picture, there is, there is available in a museum, a, the, the wooden uh, backpack that Dogen was supposed to have carried, or at least resembles what Dogen would have carried in that era when traveling around. So it was not made of polyester. <laughs> it, was, it was probably pretty heavy. Um, and, but anyway, um, he, um, he certainly learned the, uh, the, the poetic techniques. And you know, if you look at what he wrote in China, um, which to me is a very interesting thing. Before he comes back to Japan, of course, once he comes back to Japan, he writes Fukan's Nazengi uh, first. You know, um, maybe the Hokioki or the record of his conversations were recorded after that. And then uh, Bendoa and then Genjo Koan. And then he starts doing more and more in Shobo Genzo and Ehei Koloku. But what he actually wrote in China were about 50 uh, poems. Again, they appear in Taigen and Shohaku's uh, uh, translation. Um, and especially uh, that appears in uh, uh, chapter 10 or volume 10 uh, of Ehei Koloku. <clears throat> so let's look at what Dogen does with the poem. So how does Dogen change the poem? This, uh, am I there? Am I, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, this is Howard. Hi, Stephen. Oh, hi. How are you? Um, hi. This seems to me, uh, it's almost like um, the the Platform Sutra, this combination of uh, poems. The, the, and there's a little implication in the first one, uh, uh, just to wait until the golden star appears, but in here, immediately appears, and the very world is the supreme destination. Like, it's, it's already there, is my sense of it. It's already there. It's already there. Right. Yeah. Right. So it almost see it, it just has that quality of the sixth patriarch uh, poem contest where he about the dust on the on the mirror. You mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. You don't have to wipe it away. The mirror is spotless to begin with. Right. But, right. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think that becomes a paradigm for Dogen and for for others as well um, that that you can follow um, and. Um, the, um, of course, when we talk about that with the dust, um, we have to keep in mind that um, when uh, Dogen said, uh, drop off body mind or cast off body mind, um, that apparently what his teacher Ruzhing would have said, and they sounded the same in Japanese, but not quite in Chinese. So Dogen may have mis misheard it or, or deliberately changed it. Um, uh, was cast, it was what, what um, um, Rougine would have originally said was not cast off body mind, but cast off the dust from the mind. And the word for dust and the word for body sounded very similar. Uh, but in, in the writings attributed to Rougine, we only, we only see cast off the dust from the mind. And that was um, probably what he used. But dust doesn't only mean dust in the sense of defilement or pollution or or some or attachment or something negative because dust was a kind of a neutral word. Actually, the character that was used for dust was kind of a neutral word in Chinese Buddhism that meant sensation or perception or the encounter between human sense organ and the objects of perception. And therefore it wasn't necessary, it didn't necessarily have to be defiled. And that was part of the implication, I think, in, um, in, the, in the Platform Sutra poem uh, also. But anyway, um, so yes, so Dogen, by changing a few words, he says it's here and now. And if we look at the third um, line in uh, immediately the golden star appears and that word immediately is a translation of the Gen in Genjo Koan, which is the last character on the Chinese side of that. Um, so this, this world is uh, the supreme destination. So um, now how can we generalize? What's, what's, What's the point of this for Dogen?
Well, isn't it that it's always right here, but we have to, we have to see it. Right. So if we go back to the, uh, that Japanese folk song I quoted back at the beginning earlier this afternoon, um, the Buddha is ever present, but we don't, because it, you don't, you know, we don't see him right in front of us. We think it's just a misty dream. Um, you know, Dogen wants to weed out that implication. So if his, you know, his predecessors that he reveres in a certain way, but if that in implication, I think that's true in Platform Sutra, I mean, that's what Huynang is saying. Like, um, you, you, you can't let it stand if there is an implication that is going to lead you astray. And I think in Fukan Zazenki and other places, he says, you know, if there's a hair breadth of difference between practice and realization, or between um, delusion and, and enlightenment, if you let that like tiny difference stand, it's going to uh, infect uh, the understanding uh, later on in the process. Um, and and yet ahead. both verses are so valuable uh, to have to have the first from Master Longya for I think particularly for a um, an, maybe an early student to spur right. them on. Uh, do not stop uh, because it's so tempting to stop. At least it was for me at that moment. Um, yeah. But then to have um, Dogen's verse as well, I I really love seeing them side by side, but find them both really valuable. Uh, right. Yeah, that's a great so, point. It's something yeah. struck me just now. That's absolutely incredible. Uh, what if Dogen had understood Ru Ying and heard dust cast off the dust from your mind? <laughs> Would we be here today? <laughs> um, <laughs> would we be here today? Um, yeah, but we'd be following Dogen. Oh, we'd be following Ruzhin, not Dogen. <laughs> I, you know, um, yeah. Um, well, you know, I always think like, um, I mean, Shakespeare said a lot of things, right? But probably the most famous thing is to be or not to be. And, um, you know, I was looking into that at one point. Apparently, one of the early manuscripts to be and said to be and not to be, you know. And, uh, and apparently the wording was different in a couple of these earlier manuscripts. And I thought like, well, yeah, what if he, um, you know, what if it came down that differently and, and it didn't strike us in such a compelling way? So, but, um, um, <laughs> uh, I think in Dogen's case, uh, I mean, the proof is in the fact that he's continuing to do this. So this is his point, don't stop. So if he had only done that one time and not done the rest, he wouldn't have been famous. If he had done the rest and not done it that one time, I think he still would be, we, we'd still be here today. <laughs> um, the, um, um, so, um, uh, but, um, but, but, you know, this is an example of him still, you know, you can see that he's deliberately doing it. So one of the uh, scholars in Japan, actually an interesting guy uh, who, who's from China. So, in that, you know, I heard this story I, I, uh, recently, although I've known this person for a while, but in 1980, when China, you know, Mao had died a few years ago, the, it was the Deng Xiaoping era, the, the China was, you know, beginning to develop uh, economically and all that. And uh, the first glimmers of coming back to, uh, you know, so-called mainstream uh, yeah, international relations were happening. One of the things they, you know, were willing to do was to revive Buddhism. Now in that, in that time, they still didn't have a lot of money and in the 80s, the Japanese were very wealthy and the Japanese, some of the Japanese uh, leading um, monks from temples like a Tofukuji temple in Kyoto and a couple of others, but especially Fukushima Roshi, a Tofukuji temple, went to China in the 80s and brought, uh, brought their monks, brought other tourists, brought uh, uh, funding and also tourists that would come there and, and that would help the uh, economic situation at some of these old temples and contributed greatly to the um, to the renewal of a number of old temples, Jiaozhou or Joshu's temple and uh, many other temples were were started to be revived in the 1980s to, based on Japanese economy. Now Japanese economy is based on Chinese tourists coming to Japan which 
of course, has been limited during the virus. But, um, but anyway, in 1980, apparently, um, the Chinese government selected about five young monks who they sent to Japan to get educated in the Japanese system and, and the, but to understand you know, what Japanese scholarship had produced and to come back to China and, um, and, and, and start establishing academies to, to study the history of Buddhism, especially Zen. In, in China. And um, anyway, one of them, you know, never made it back to China. And he stayed in Japan, became a professor in Japan and gave up the monkhood and, and all this stuff. And uh, he translated Shobo Genzo into modern uh, Chinese. Um, and so it's, it's kind of um, interesting to, to think uh, coming kind of full circle, like Dogen misunderstood it. But he, his view of Dogen is he, he coined the term, Dogen was a genius of misreading. So going back to that question, will we be here? I think that is an intriguing question. Uh, but, um, but the genius of the misreading continues. Now others, you know, there were people and followers of Soto Zen in the, in the 1700s. Uh, there was a whole faction led by this guy, Tenke Densong, uh, which said like Dogen misunderstood. He, he missed the Chinese and they rewrote some of what he, you know, they started to rewrite him because they said, no, he, he just didn't understand it in some cases. Um, that was a minority report, of course, but um, it, it, was, it was there. Now, okay, let's look at the next example. Next example is a little bit different because this is more of a biographical reflection. And I think one thing about the poetry for Dogen is, and we saw that a little bit with the Fukakusa, you know, we get a kind of an, and, and the one about, you know, giving up, fame, giving up um, paper and pen. Um, you know, we get a little bit more of the emotional side of Dogen. Some people say Dogen's very uh, kind of puritanical and kind of severe. And uh, what about the compassion? I think that if you read Shobogen's Ozui Monkey, uh, Record of Things Heard is, is one of the main translations. Um, you know, we do see a very deeply compassionate side of Dogen. Um, but, um, and, 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 and he uses a lot of common sense examples in teaching, like, um, um, but by, by, um, by, by, it doesn't have that high-minded philosophical or poetic impulse so much. It's more, it's more uh, down-to-earth examples that he gives of what it means to be a good leader, what it means to be disciplined, what it means to follow the correct path and not to stray, uh, what it means for the chief cook to make food that uh, others want to eat, not things that he thinks are important, and, and uh, observations like that. But, um, but here, I think we also get a sense of his own uh, emotion. Now, the story goes, and uh, some, some people dispute this, but when Dogen was at Aheji in, in 1247, he was called by the Shogun to come to the town of Kamakura, where the Shogun was gonna build a new temple, which turned out to be Kenchoji Temple, which th is still the main, the biggest Zen temple in the town of Kamakura outside of Kyoto, and outside of Tokyo. And um, eventually the leadership went to a Chinese immigrant monk um, named Lanke Dolyu, and, Japanese. Um, but, and uh, Dogen was supposedly offered that. Now, if you see that film called Zen, that's titled Zen from 2009, it was kind of a biopic of Dogen with a famous kabuki actor playing Dogen. And I think it's a very good film. Uh, it's, a, uh, I, I hope some people have seen that. It's, it's available. I think it can be, you know, you can see it for, for free on the internet, but I don't, I'm not sure of the availability right now, but it's, um, it's available with subtitles and you know, it's got a lot of, um, you know, it stretches the, the history quite a bit. But I think there's a very interesting scene when he goes to talk to the Shogun, he goes to teach the Shogun. And the Shogun, you know, regrets his life of uh, violence and, and bloodshed. And, and, and in history, you know, that Shogun did become a monk. He gave up his Shogunate and he became a monk and he practiced meditation. Not with Dogen, but he was looking for Dogen to be the teacher. And Dogen apparently was, um, you know, disturbed that he would lose his integrity if he took this offer. You know, and Dogen often cited the case of a famous uh, Chinese uh, monk from that era in the 10 hundreds, uh, early Soto uh, monk in China, who, um, who turned down the uh, imperial robe several times, uh, the offer of the imperial robe, because he just didn't want to get entangled with the political forces. Uh, as, as we've seen with Susha, that, that there's, you know, if you, if you refuse to take, uh, to get along with the politics, you could be punished for it. Maybe Dogen left Kyoto because of, 
the politics. Um, so here's another occasion where he's entangled in the socio-political happenings and he goes there and he spends about six months and he doesn't live in a temple because there is no temple for him to live in. So he lives in the home of Hatano, uh, his samurai patron who encouraged them and accompanied him on the trip. And in this poem, there's an interesting uh, onomatopoeia with the Chinese pronunciation in the third line because he says like he fell into this kind of slumber, taking his rice in the home of a layman and um, you know, letting the snow collect and he's kind of uh, frozen, stiff it sounds like and not really responsive. And he kind of lost his spunk in a way. Um, and then um, he hears the spring uh, thunderbolts which is the onomatopoeia. And um, then he wants to go back to, um, even though he's not in Kyoto anymore because he's in a Heiji in the mountains, but it's, it's in that di general direction and the climate and the, and the uh, you know, the outlook's pretty similar. So I think he's saying, he, hey, let me go back there. And then he, he, he gave a, a prose sermon when he gets back and he apologized to people apparently the monks weren't happy. It's hard to say if they were unhappy, but you know they were glad to see him back, uh, coming back to um, uh, to Eheji to guide them. Because what what would their um, so? I think if he had stayed in Kamakura, we definitely would not be here today. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, and um, but um, okay, one thing I wanted to get to, uh, and let's go back up. Uh, a little bit. Yeah, keep going. Uh, keep going to the next page one, I think. Okay. So let's look at this poem by Muso Soseki. I'm sure some of you know that Muso Soseki was one of the Rinzai leaders in the 1300s. So this is, um, you know, he was becoming very prominent in the 1330s. So it's about a hundred years after uh, Dogen returned from China and established his temples in Kyoto and in the uh, mountains. And um, it's, uh, you know, there's very interesting what happened in the, over those hundred years. But one of the things that happened was that a lot of the Japanese monks started going to, to China. One of the things was that when Dogen went, um, he was only uh, one of a handful of monks who was able to go to China in that era. And, you know, one of only two or three really famous ones that went in that, in that era. Um, but by a hundred years later, dozens of um, Japanese monks were going to study in China. And a lot of what they were going to do was to study the poetry. Um, and, um, and they, um, uh, that was mostly the Rinzai monks, but it also included some famous uh, Soto monks who wanted to learn the, po the how to write Chinese poetry in Chinese from the Chinese teachers directly. And some of them kept up a correspondence and they exchanged letters with the Chinese teachers after they returned to, to Japan. Some of them didn't return to Japan. They stayed in China. And in a couple cases, it seems like they became head of temples in, in China. Um, now, Muso Soseki was one of the famous monks from that era, but he actually did not go to China. And there were a couple of others who did not go to China, but seemed to have learned enough Chinese in Japan to write these Chinese style poems. And so that's another, you know, very interesting thing because, um, you know, Dogen said you had to have face-to-face -face transmission. I mean, one of his main points is had to have face-to-face. -face. Now, um, a hundred years later, could that face-to-face -face mean that you had a face-to-face -face with a Japanese student and a Chinese teacher, but the Chinese teacher had, was in Japan, and so the student didn't have to go to China? Or did it mean that the student had to go to China anyway? So a lot of them thought, well, they better go to China in one way or another, but some of them, for various reasons, didn't go, but maybe they had the face-to-face -face with, you know, by staying in Japan. Um, now, Uh, one of the reasons I want to refer to this poem is because you can see in the fourth line, 
it uses the term uh, Genjo Koan. And um, obviously that's uh, one of the main concepts and one of the main fascicles of, uh, of Shobo Genzo. And I think, um, you know, one of the things I've, I've come to realize um, was that, you know, misimpression I had for a long time myself was that, um, you know, somehow, um, you know, Dogen was using this word in a special way. And he did, of course, there's no question about that. I'm not trying to take anything away from that. But uh, the point I do want to make is that other people were using that word in pretty much the same way, including uh, this famous uh, Rinzai monk. Um, so uh, Dogen didn't invent the word. Um, it comes, it was used very prominently in the Blue Cliff record. Um, Dogen gave it his own special meaning, but there's other uh, in, you know, uses of it that are kind of similar. So one thing I wanted to consider was uh, how Muso Soseki is using that word as critical to his poem, and how does it feel for those of you who, you know, who are familiar with Dogen's Genjo Koan. And um, now, because that word is such an intriguing and um, multi-valent uh, word, you know, it, it means that it can be translated in different ways. And you, you see a lot of translations. I, the translation I've been using recently is uh, realization here and now. Um, but, you know, there's, there's other good translations out there um, that, that, you know, make a lot of sense. And um, the uh, fundamental, uh, what uh, Kaz Tanahashi has, um, I, I guess, actualizing the fundamental point, I think. Um, and that's, that's also a good, uh, obviously, that's a great translation as well. Uh, so I think in that case, uh, Genjo is actualizing. The Gen of Genjo is what we saw above with the immediacy in that poem where Dogen says immediate. Um, and the Jo means to become immediate. And koan, of course, uh, you know, has a lot of uh, meanings, but one thing is it's the fundamental point because it, it, you know, it points, it's the direct pointing at reality without anything intervening. But it also refers to the puzzle of, uh, and, the, and the paradoxes of the koan stories that need to be interpreted and reinterpreted. Um, okay, so would anybody uh, please read this poem? I will actually. Autumn colored word branches dropping many leaves, frosty clouds carrying rain pass through this nook in the mountains. Everyone is born with the same sort of eyes. Why can't they see the Cohen that is right in front of us? Okay, um, so why can't they? <laughs> or any any thoughts about this one you don't see with your eyes uh okay so you see with the with the dharma eye true seeing uh, you see with your ears right and you hear with your with you with your eyes that's another Another famous saying. Um, I wonder to kind of get back to your the theme of ambivalence with the words, like because there's a poem in the way. Uh, okay, so um, there's a poem in the way, or there's a poem that's not in the way. Well, there's a poem blocking the view. Is I guess what I'm trying to say. Okay, so his poem is blocking everybody else's view. Would you would you say that? Maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, well, I think you're right. I mean, it is, I think it is partly the ambivalence of the words. So what, what it, uh, you know, he makes this interesting comment, or at least the way translating it here. Um, um, the, um, that the leaves are kind of like words. So the leaves, uh, the autumn leaves falling away um, is kind of like words being thrown out or the, 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 you know, throwing sand in people's faces as we had in another example. Um, 
and um, the um, now I think one thing here is uh, um, you know we talked about how some of these poems end with the description of nature, right? Um, you know the rain falling, the uh, uh, the birds flying off, and that kind of thing. Here it's at the beginning. I think this is uh, this is going back to the what stands in the way, what's obstructing the seeing. Um, so it does kind of reinforce that idea that, but he's kind of flipping the usual pattern. This this recalls to me uh, one of one of the koan where. Uh, forgetting the teacher, uh, people see this flower nowadays as in a dream. Mm -hmm. so there's this, you know, the manifest truth is right there. Right. Um, I'll speak for myself. I like to dress it up and interpose myself between the truth and this. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we ourselves are often an obstacle to our own realization, and yet the gateway as well. So, right, right. So we're the necessary gateway, but we can get lost in those cobwebs. Um, we, can, we can use the person status, or we can get lost in that. In that. So I think um, so. Everybody has the eyes to see it. How does he know that they don't see it? Um, yeah, I mean, the, um, um, uh, well, I, I would answer that in two ways. One way is, one point is that the, um, you know, another possible tr translation, because th the grammar is so uh, open-ended in these things, it could be like, why am I the only one who, who sees it? Um, Why does he think that? That's the problem. Pardon me, I think, huh? what's that? I said, why does he think that? That's the problem. Yeah, right. Um, that would still be a problem, that why, how does he know? Um, well, you know, we could say he's an arrogant and teacher who, <laughs> you know, the, doesn't trust anybody else's judgment, but, um, <clears throat> um, you know, that's an interesting point. I mean, I think uh, now that I, you know, when I'm thinking about it that way, um, you know, it's, it's very, uh, it doesn't say I and it doesn't say they. It's just like, what, what is the, uh, what does it take to see the, you know, what's, what does it take to Genjo Kohan? You know, why don't they Genjo Kohan? Why don't they realize what's right in front of us? But that flower is there. So we're all an obstacle. So I think, yeah, maybe the accusatory tone of it um, is, you know, I'd have to rethink that translation. Maybe it doesn't need to have that accusatory tone. Although, you know, it wouldn't be unlike the Zen teacher to, to reprimand uh, foolish, stubborn uh, disciples, but- um, I don't see it that way at all. I see it as really compassionate. Um, you know, when, uh, when you're in a Zen center, what you find is all these kind of broken souls that come to find themselves and to, right. to organize themselves. And, and it's, it's heartbreaking. And so uh, why can't they see that they are ex exactly what they're looking for? It seems to me that's something that, that is certainly a part of the Zen tradition is understanding right. that. Um, yeah, yeah. So the truth is there. So I think one, yeah, one thing I wanted to point out, actually, your, your, this comment is very helpful because it kind of makes the segue from the ambivalence to the affirmation. So, uh, we, you know, we've seen some affirmation embedded in all these poems, but here it's pretty clear that fourth line could be read as like, hey, it's right here. So, uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's not just right here, it's, with, it's in the nook, it's in the mountains, it's in the leaves, it's in the falling, it's in the, in the, um, in the colorful leaves, it's in the fallen leaves. Um, it's, just, it's just clear seeing what's in front of you. So let's look at some other examples of affirmation. So let's, uh, if we could scroll down. Um, Um, okay, let's uh, let's scroll. Keep going. 
please. Thank you. So let's go to, um, okay, uh, let's, yeah, a firm path. So here's a walk up poem by uh, the same author, Muso Soseki. And um, like Dogen, uh, a lot of these poems both wrote, a lot of these poets wrote, but Hmong poets wrote in both the, the uh, um, uh, Chinese style and the Japanese style. And um, then, uh, here's where we get this, I think, uh, affirmation that kind of complements the poem we just saw. Anywhere I seem to go becomes the road home. So we talked about, you know, arriving at the destination and the implication that there is, um, you know, Dogen tried to weed out that implication that there's something futural, something you have to anticipate, something you're getting to. And he's saying it, it's immediately right here and now. And I think Muso Soseki, uh, you know, coming from a different uh, lineage, but uh, influenced up by some of the same, um, thinking, but you know, I'm not saying they're identical at all. There's a lot of differences, but at this point here, he's making, I think a very similar affirmation. Um, anywhere I go is the road home. Um, so the step back can be a step forward. The step back is to the, is to the retreat, but the step back is also, let's go to the next place. Um, okay. So um, now let's look at the poem um, just below, a couple below, um, call, where it says affirm more examples. So um, this was an early poem written in the uh, 800s. And it's inscribed at the temple uh, called Jashan Temple which is in uh, Hunan province in China. And this is the temple that's uh, famous for a number of things. And uh, one thing is that this was where the uh, Blue Cliff record was uh, uh, composed or the, the second stage of the commentary in the, that was written in the 1100s at this temple. And, um, and still famous for, for that achievement. Um, but the temple had been uh, established a few hundred years earlier. And there's a famous uh, spring there called the Blue Cliff uh, Spring. And so that's why it's called the Blue Cliff Record. Um, and uh, that spring, uh, they say, had some uh, uh, water with these, um, it's, you know, it's hard to, hard to say. And they still try to make the claim today. It's, uh, I'm a little skeptical, but you know, the, that it was like some special kind of water was coming out of that spring with good nutrients and it was perfect for making uh, tea. Um, and, um, you know, the whole uh, Zen and tea and tea ceremony, you know, evolved in many ways over the years, but some people trace it back to this uh, temple on the Blue Cliff uh, Spring. And to try to play on that theme, a few years ago, the temple brought in, well, maybe about 20 years ago, they brought in a famous tea master from Kyoto um, and had the Japanese tea master taste the tea that they made from that spring. And they claim that he said, hey, this is the best tea I've ever had. <laughs> but uh, uh, who knows for sure. But um, um, what, um, any thoughts on this uh, poem? So this, this was, um, you know, it's, it's still uh, inscribed on a, on a, uh, on a stone, uh, on a stele um, at this temple. The cloister is filled with the sound of the spring and the temple halls feel refreshed. So in those days, I think without, you know, I, or up in the mountains, there's no sound pollution of any sort. Um, and you could hear the, uh, you know, the gurgling of the spring. As, as the only sound that's gonna penetrate inside the temple uh, walls. Uh, through an opening in the curtain, the light rain carries the scent of forested pines. Well, we've had the rain in the pines before, uh, but here he adds, you know, through an opening in the curtain. So it imply, or, you know, the curtain, uh, it's not clear what the you know, curtain could have been, um, I guess, 
you know, it's not clear what, what the material of the curtain was. And maybe it's more of a door, maybe it's more of a wood door that, that might keep out uh, uh, not only the sounds, but the smells. Um, gazing to the south from the eastern peak, the moon appears through the raindrops and is smiling while its golden light gently touches the cool waters below. Um, so any thoughts on this one? This, this poem seems so much more lyrical than the Soseki poems. And the Soseki poems seem to me very biographical, talking about his own route, perhaps, to, the, to Genja Cohen or to understanding. And this mm -hmm. seems very, very, almost like romantic, Wordsworthian. Right, this is just nature, right? Not, not any kind of reflection or, um, or comment or, or uncertainty or, questioning or, um, you know, so I, I mean, I think both, both types have a role. I think, pro, pro, you know, one way to interpret it historically would be that in that era, you know, coming so early in that era when Zen was first being established, one thing Zen introduced into people's thinking was the idea of doubt. I mean, that was emphasized very strongly in, you know, in Dogen's doubt when that caused him to go to China and, and you know, have uh, Shinjin Datsuraku, and that's why we're here. Some of us are here today. <laughs> the, um, but that idea of doubt, you know, was, was a topic that kind of evolved in Zen over those centuries. And you see it in Dogen, you see it in Muso Soseki, and you see it in Susha like a couple of hundred years later. And I'm not saying that they couldn't have had doubt in this earlier era as well, but we don't see it in this example. It's just like, uh, you know, the blessings uh, from nature are overwhelming us. But at the same time, you know, the fact that we feel refreshed, the fact that the, that the rain, uh, you know, brings in this scent, uh, you know, means that maybe we're fatigued, maybe he's fatigued, maybe he's exhausted, maybe he's frustrated, maybe, maybe he needs that rejuvenation coming from nature. So maybe there is a uncertainty or doubt beneath the surface a little bit. And of course the moon appearing um, on the cold waters below, you know, recalls the moon and the dewdrop idea, which Stogan and others uh, use uh, very effectively. Um, so we can see some of the origins of what's going to happen later. But I agree that the atmosphere in, in Muso Soseki is, is quite, quite different. Okay, um, next one by a monk named Hongja. He is, he was a couple gener, he was a Soto, he was a famous Soto monk poet um, a couple of generations before Rujing. So when Dogen got to um, China in the 1220s, of course, Hongja was, uh, was dead for a couple generations. But um, Ru Jing uh, praised him very highly and uh, Dogen studied him very carefully and Dogen refers to him quite a bit. And in, in the Ehe Koloku, you can see that there's many examples where Dogen cites him. And also in the fascicle uh, Zazen Shin, um, the point of meditation or the point of Zazen or the, or the lancet of uh, Zazen, uh, translated in different ways. Um, the, um, um, uh, he cites Hongzhi's poem about, about meditation and, and comments on it and rewrites it quite a bit. So it's another example of the never taking at face value what the teacher has said. So uh, would anybody uh, like to read this one? Sure, I'd be happy to. Okay. Peach flowers distract my eyes as I follow the butterflies who recognize an old friend floating like a cloud. Cherishing the mountains and rivers is a luxury I don't mind. The pure light of the frosty moon fills the pavilion window. All right, thank you. Any, any thoughts on that? Is, uh, is a luxury I don't mind because he's a monk, he's not supposed to have luxuries? Or... 
<clears throat> right. I, th I think Shozan has a comment when you have a moment. Um, you're right the, about the luxury. Uh, go ahead. Can you unmute Shozan? Thank you. Sorry, Dr. Hein, I just had a question about what do you mean when you said Dogon brought uh, uh, doubt? Can you just, you know, explain that a little bit more, what you mean? Yeah, okay. So um, I think, um, I mean, one of the things we talk about with Dogon's life story is that when he became a monk, he very quick, uh, quickly started questioning uh, the senior monks at the at the temple, like his first temple was was not a Zen temple because Zen was was just getting started. So he he went to the typical temple, which was called the Tendai School, and they were famous for the doctrine of original enlightenment. And the idea of original enlightenment could be interpreted in different ways, but basically it meant like, okay, we all have it, and we've been saying this already, but what do we do with it? And so Dogen said, well, if I have it, then why do I have to meditate? If I have it, why do I have to practice this one? Why do I have to do anything if, I, if we already have it? You know, if it's an original endowment, if it's an innate uh, quality. So that was Dogen's doubt. What was the ne necessity of practicing meditation and other discipline if, if, I, if, if we are all endowed with that? But I think doubt in a broader sense had been developing in Zen in China in a very kind of, uh, I think a, a kind of contemporary way. I mean, I think this is one of the things that why Zen has uh, contemporary resonance is like we get these stories about people in China and Japan from that era where, you know, and, and we've seen some examples with Musou and with Dogen and with Susha and, and the step back guy where they're, you know, the, they're finding their way. They, they, they're struggling to get the wisdom. They're struggling to express it. They want to uh, stay clear of uh, uh, things that would uh, disturb their integrity and disturb their quietude, but they also realize they can't just stand back as recluses. They have to convey it. They have to express it. And so every step of the way, there's a doubt. Now, they, you know, they started to develop this idea, which, um, you know, is, is still used in some circles in Zen of what they call the Zen sickness or the Zen malady. And the Zen, you know, and the idea is like when you're pursuing Zen um, and it, it creates this very deep sense of uncertainty about how do you attain it? How do you express it? How do you convey it? How do you keep a balance between um, your, your calm disposition and trying to deal with uh, many forces that that are uh, adversarial or threatening in some way. And you have, you know, social and political pressures and you have psychological uh, stress and all those kinds of things. I think it has a very contemporary flair and that kind of storytelling that uh, Dogen does and other teachers of that time do. And to the point where they get sick. I mean, when Dogen uh, got to China and he took that boat ride, he, he couldn't land in China for, uh, at least a few weeks, maybe a couple months, because he said he was sick and he couldn't do it. And um, the monk that he went with, um, uh, who was a senior to him, a guy named Myozen, he died after two years. Dogen lasted for four, Dogen spent four years there, but the monk who was his senior died in two years. And mainly they said, well, that it was too stressful because uh, it, it was, you know, it just produced a lot of anxiety. Obviously, being in the new country created you know, a lot of language barriers and cultural barriers. So I think that's a quality that gets woven into a lot of the stories about the Zen teachers. And, and you know, with, we talk about anxiety, angst in the contemporary world quite a bit. And I think that's what has a flavor to it. We can see them trying to reconcile with some of the same, you know, it seems like very remote lifestyle and very different in a lot of ways. But I think that the storytelling of these, individuals who are trying to preserve their individual integrity and yet uh, remain committed. That's why on that Fukakusa poem we read, you know, he said, there's one thing I can't forget. There's one thing I still must do. And it's like they all, you have to be committed to teaching, to sharing, to getting that entanglement um, with disciples, to rubbing the sticks together with somebody. You can't, 
you know, so all of those are doubt pro provoking. Is that, I hope I answered it. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. So back on this, on this one. Okay. The luxury. So, you know, cherishing, you know, the nature, just looking at the mountains and rivers is, is all the luxury that you need. Um, and how about the butterflies? Yeah, I see that, um, that he's certainly in a position of luxury because he's looking at these beautiful butterflies, yet something even more beautiful distracts him. And he uses the word distract. It's like such a, it's such a luxury to say, oh, it's not like he noticed it. It's like, oh, it's distracted by something else, these peach flowers. Like this is, right. the, like, this is where I find myself right now. And the rest of the poem is just filled with things. It's floating like a cloud. Uh, it's a luxury. He's unapologetically saying he doesn't mind the luxury. Um, and then the last line is very nice. Right, right. Um, so, you know, uh, Muhammad Ali, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Well, here we have the floating like the butterfly part. Um, and, uh, you know, you have solidarity with the butterflies. You have solidarity with the spiders. You know, you, you, when you're, you know, that, uh, I think one of the things I want to emphasize is the fine uh, detail. In fact, um, you know, if, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, as we're talking about it, I'm, I'm recalling that, you know, in some of the, um, so Dogen, you know, obviously had the Genjo Koan and so did Muso and some others. But there was another um, approach. It wasn't necessarily that much different, but a term that was used is like see things in their fine detail. Um, you know, um, look at the small details. That's a kind of Genjo Koan in, in its own way. It's a little bit different alternative. The Genjo Koan is more like big picture, taking the mountains and rivers. But when you take in the mountains and rivers and 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 not you know lose the uh, not not lose the trees for the forest so to speak. I I see an allusion here to relative and absolute. Um, there are layers. There's a foreground and a background. Okay. In, in this vision, so the butterflies are you know this highly unstable phenomenal situation where. Although evanescent, the peach flowers are, by comparison, much more stable. Mm. And effectively, without a lot of wind, they're fixed in the vision. Uh, and superimposed are these, you know, um, very related, you know, not separate, but their quality is quite different. Their energy is quite different and dependent on the fundamental or blossoms. Probably I've just smeared the whole thing with a bunch of poison. Well, yeah, I, I mean, uh, okay. But I, yeah, I think one way to t maybe take that point, if I understood your point, was to, um, okay, the butterflies, yeah, they're, they're going to come and go, you know, they're going to flutter away almost instantly, right? Uh, but you try to follow them, and maybe more butterflies will come or something uh, similar. Um, you know, peach, peach flowers, they're not going to be there forever, but maybe they're there for a week or so, so they're steadier. Um, and then, you know, behind that, you have the, uh, the mountains and rivers that, you know, aren't budging, probably. Um, and, uh, but then the, and then the moon, you know, is that cyclical, you throw in the cyclical aspect of it. So you have the forefronting of the butterflies, and then in the middle ground, the peach, and then the mountains and rivers in the background. Um, but um, in a way, because they're the constancy of it, they, they're more present to you than the fleeting. And then the frosty moon is uh, coming and going, waxing and waning, and appearing and disappearing. But when it's there, it fills. So it fills the windows, it fills the cobwebs, it fills the, um, you know, it fills the water. Um, so, you know, it's, I mean, the, the emphasis on, on the moon is something that they, um, you know, that, that uh, is going to appear over and over again. All right, so let's, uh, let's go on. Let's go on. I, I have a question about this one. Um, is he inside or outside? For the first three lines, I thought he was outside, and then suddenly the moon is filling the pavilion. What do you think? Well, 
Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I think the pavilion is one of those indoor outdoor spaces. So it doesn't have solid walls all around it. And that's the whole, the, you know, the point of the pavilion would be that it's a structure that allows you to view, you know, the moon viewing pavilion was the common theme. So the pavilion is probably an open structure, maybe near the water, maybe over a lake or, or near the river um, that, that, um, that, uh, that does create some um, distance or, you know, there's something, um, but I, I think that's how, I, that's how I would take it. Um, you know, one thing, and you know, this is, this is changing quite a bit, but you know, when I was first going to Japan back in the uh, 70s and you saw more older fashion uh, structures, but even the modern housing, um, if they had a patio or a veranda or, you know, some outdoor space, um, you know, they didn't have like um, um, sliding glass doors <laughs> and, and screens. Uh, so it was either open or not open to, to uh, nature. So that, you know, if it was open, it meant that, you know, the breezes would come in and the light would come in, but it also meant that, you know, the bugs could come in and, and the uh, mugginess could come in. But it was kind of like, you know, very free, free floating indoor outdoor space, uh, even in some examples of modern Japan. And I think uh, that's kind of what's being implied here. Um, so, okay, Howard, let me ask you a question. Okay. Okay. Um, so, you know, we talked about the uh, Dylan part. Is it, do you think it's a good time to do that or should we stick with the Zen? Um, uh I'd be interested in hearing a little about Dylan, just to bring it, bring it fully into the, almost fully into the modern. Okay. All right. So uh, some of you may be more or less familiar with uh, Bob Dylan lyrics, but let, let's take a, let's take a diversion here. Um, Nobel Prize winner from 2016. So if we could, if we could scroll down to those um, last couple pages. And then we'll come back and finish off with uh, a couple of Dogen. So, um, so I don't know, there, there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's like six or 700 uh, Dylan songs out these days and some, some are better known than, than others. But th this is, I think, uh, one of the favorites for, for Dylan, Bob Dylan fans uh, from 1965. Uh, that is still played a lot in his concerts and um, and and covered a lot by by different musicians and it's a <clears throat> it's a bluesy kind of song and it's it's um, you know the lyrics are are kind of simple but I think that you know there's a kind of Zen quality and a kind of um, uh, it, both in the ret rhetorical style and in that whole sense of like we're, what we're talking about with um, with kind of uh, the doubt coming kind of um, coming across in relation to images from nature. All this is kind of packed into these three short uh, verses. Um, so if you're familiar with the music, you know, you can sort of play it in your mind. If not, maybe you can, you can uh, uh, play it, uh, find, you know, YouTube it later. But um, to give a little background, the song from 1965 was on the album Highway 61 Revisited. So as, as uh, I'm sure some of you know that, you know, Dylan, career started in the, uh, like in 62, 63, and he was famous for the protest songs, Times Are Changing, God on Our Side, um, Hard Rain's Gonna Fall, Blowing in the Wind. And then he, as, as events were changing, he was sort of uh, turning away from what he called finger pointing songs and giving a more um, kind of uh, philosophical or surrealistic um, critique of society, which you can see in a lot of songs on, on this, the albums from this period. And, um, and a lot of people, and then he also went electric and, you know, the folk music people, some of them were upset with that change. And, um, and, and so Dogen, uh, so Dogen, so Dylan was cast in a sense of, uh, 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 at this career stage, I think, with a strong sense of this down, because even though he was commercially successful in some ways. Um, and his name was out there and he, and he had a big reputation. 
uh, people's expectations of what he was supposed to do and people expecting him to write the kind of music that, that you know they wanted to hear and he was trying to explore different musical styles and different um, uh, sources of inspiration you know that that was uh, coming in conflict but it was also you know for for those of you familiar with the society at that time I mean it was the you know, the, the, the pro-civil rights era was turning into the anti-Vietnam era very quickly. And the uh, Linda Johnson administration, in, you know, between 64 and 66, the atmosphere in the country was changing with this kind of um, discontent and dread setting in as, as the Vietnam War was escalating. And, um, and there were backlashes with the civil rights. And... Uh, and so there was, um, you know, a feeling, some of the feelings of optimism of the earlier 60s were becoming um, a, a little more, uh, you know, feeling was becoming a little more dire. So if we look at the, um, at the first verse, he says, I ride on a mail train and can't buy a thrill. I'm up all night leaning on the windowsill but if I die on top of the hill, if I don't make it, you know, my baby will. He uses the word baby here <laughs> several, several times in these, in these verses. But, um, you know, I listened to this song for many, many years, and I thought of it in a certain way. And then when he, you know, I had written a book about uh, Dylan and Zen influences and possible Zen influences or Zen connections. And um, that was back in 2009. Uh, but when he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2016, you know, one of the things that happened was that about two weeks later, um, his good friend and another, you know, amazing singer, songwriter and poet, Leonard Cohen, uh, died. And um, uh, both were, um, uh, you know, Jewish background and, and used uh, Jewish uh, imagery and other religious imagery in a lot of ways. Both had a strong interest in, I think, in uh, Asian, some aspects of Asian thought, especially Leonard Cohen, of course, practiced Zen for for 10 years, um, um, although he didn't necessarily um, uh, write music about Zen and Leonard. Um, but but um, anyway, the point was that I came to look at this, this particular poem, uh, this particular song quite differently than I had ever seen it before because I started to think of the idea of both uh, Dylan and Leonard Cohen as kind of these uh, biblical prophets who were kind of foreseeing things or trying to show, show the way. And yet uh, very reluctantly because it takes a toll on the prophet. And, you know, back in the biblical times, they talked about the reluctant prophet, the prophet that was, uh, you know, didn't choose to be it, but was kind of chosen. That was the way chosen for them, you know, by God in, in, in biblical terms or by, by the fate or the karma or the, you know, the, the, the mission that, he, that each of us tries to pursue. And so I started to see it, uh, you know, this kind of simple verse in that, in that light. And um, uh, so let's take the image, I ride on a mail train, you know, based on what I'm saying, or if you're familiar with the, you know, his background, uh, any thoughts on what that image might mean? I, I, well, I, a mail train would be very slow and would make lots and lots of stops. It's, he certainly couldn't buy a thrill on a train like that. Okay. A mail train is slow and making a lot of stops. Very good point. Was there another comment I heard? I, I thought it might relate to uh, sort of riding on the back of the civil rights movement or, you know, on, on the train following the times and all the protest uh, songs. And he was made into a prophet, but he didn't want to be a prophet. Uh, and he can't buy a thrill. He's, he's, not, he's, not, he's not happy being riding this train uh, and uh, he, can't, he, can't, he can't buy a thrill. So he takes the electric guitar. Uh, right. Good. Yeah, I like both of those comments a lot. And that's, uh, that's, uh, you know, that captures what I was thinking. Um, so, 
the mail train is slow. The mail train is carrying mail, right? I mean, that's the first thing. So it's carrying messages. And usually it's handed to people individually or, you know, um, but there may be some bulk mail <laughs> that everybody's getting the same uh, advertisement or the same rhetoric. But this is what he's doing. And it, yeah, he's, 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 you know, I think in connecting the civil rights and, the, you know, because he had written the anti-war songs also. He had written some pro-civil rights songs and he had written some anti-war songs even before Vietnam really escalated back, back in the Cuban Missile Crisis era. Um, Masters of War, um, God on Our Side, and, um, and he's kind of has this duty, responsibility, he doesn't really want to have it. He's got to lean, he's got to keep all night on the windowsill. And he's not, he's not sure if he's going to make it. And of course, we know that, you know, it wasn't too much later. It was like, what, a year later, he had the famous motorcycle accident. And, you know, people didn't know, he wasn't that injured, but people didn't know at the time. And uh, since, since many other uh, famous uh, singers from that era, you know, um, died on the motorcycle or from, or from one way or, you know, a drug overdose or something. Okay. So were Next. you, were you, when you, you thought of this, uh, this first uh, quadrain, oh, is it, you know, also it reminded me because I'm a Zen person yeah. of, uh, you know, wanting to, sitting and wanting to get clarity and just, it's not working. You're just sitting right. and sitting. <laughs> right. Right. And uh, you feel like you might die on the top of the hill right. um, because it's just not, it's not happening. And so I mean, you, that's a universal recommend? thing. Yes. What do you recommend when you get to that, when you're kind of walking into a wall kind of feeling? When you're walking into the wall, I think you have to get up and walk around the room and sit back down. Take the step back. Yeah. And step, and sit down and yeah. shut up. Set up. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it just reminded me of that. Uh, yes. And I think that's, you know, part of that doubt, uncertainty kind of feeling that, that, you know, has a, that has a very contemporary resonance for all of us, whether we're doing, whether we're doing practice or not, but in the practice world, it can also happen. It doesn't make it disappear. So it has to be, it has to be worked through with. So in, you know, if, if his mission is to be a kind of, not just an entertainer, but a, some, somebody who's got a message in his work, um, how do you get that, that across? Okay, so second um, verse. Uh, uh, now here, all these lines are borrowed from famous blues songs from, you know, the Delta blues musicians from the late 1920s and 30s. So if you go, if you trace these, He's basically doing what we see the Zen teachers doing, where they have the elusive variation and they throw it in a different way. And here he's got the mama word a couple of times. So don't look, the moon look good shining through the trees. Don't the brake men look good flagging down the double E. Now we got to consider that these blues, history of the blues, of the, especially what they call the Delta blues in Mississippi, especially in Mississippi Delta area in the 1920s, uh, coincided with the rapid development of railroads. So a lot of the abused musicians were born into, you know, sharecropper families that had no money and, you know, a lot of, you know, social discrimination, all the rest of it. And a way to escape was to get a train, you know. Right. So that's the way to freedom. Huh? That's the way to freedom. And yeah. get up north, go to Chicago, go to St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, all those became blues blue cities because of that, that migration, you know. Um, the Great Migration. Pardon me? It's the Great Migration. Great Migration, exactly. But especially in the blues world, you know, you have uh, Muddy Waters and, um, uh, uh, he, you know, he's maybe the most famous one who became, a, you know, famous in Chicago. But they start out um, uh, playing blues in, um, you know, in this farmland in Mississippi, playing acoustic guitar, and then they go north and they play electric guitar. So Dogen's, uh, Dogen, Dylan is going through, you know, that kind of um, uh, transformation. Um, and, um, and th but you see nature, the trees, the moon. Um, now the brakeman looks good because, uh, you know, it means the, pr I, I take it as like the train is making progress. That slow train is getting somewhere and it's making it stops. And the sun goes down over the sea. That to me is a kind of an Asian image because it's going down, but the going down with the sun 
is, is just as beautiful, the sunset is just as beautiful as the sun rising. And um, okay, now the winter time is coming. The windows are filled with frost. I went to tell everybody, but I could not get across. I want to be your lover. I don't want to be your boss. Don't say I never warn you when your train gets lost. Any thoughts there? What's winter time? Depression. What's that? Depression, despondency. Uh, Depression, despondency, and I think, you know. I mean, Emptiness. Yeah. Heart. Right, right, the winter of our discontent. And, you know, if you go back to the 60s, I mean, you know, Woodstock was a couple of years late, was four years later, I guess, and, um, but, you know, the Manson uh, murders were that same summer. And, you know, that kind of, you know, the, the, the kind of utopian uh, worldview that was developing, that somehow there's a better, more perfect life. So, you know, he, as, as a, this reluctant prophet, he could probably say, hey, no, you know, it's not gonna be so simple. And the windows are filled with thrust, so it's hard for me to even see outside and see you people that I'm trying to communicate with. I, so I wanna tell you, but I couldn't get across and are people listening or they, you know, you can't deliver that mail. But I don't want to be your boss. I don't want to be the one to tell you what to do. I can't be the one to instruct you. Um, but don't say I'd ever warn you when your train gets lost. So, you know, in the, uh, I sometimes think of this line, you know, in the university setting, uh, you know, some of you have probably been in or in or out or university teaching and, you know, you have the publisher parish and you have the, you know, tenure uh, world. And um, when I, sometimes when I see colleagues coming up for tenure and I wanna give them my brilliant advice, like, you know, you have a year and a half left, you better do X, Y, and Z. And when they, if they don't really pay attention to what I'm saying, and I think one of my um, former MA students, Jonathan is here, right? And I do that with the MA students also, right? I give you my brilliant advice. Yes, yes you do. And when you don't, you of course followed it, but some of the others, you know, I, what I wanted to say to them was, don't say I never warn you when your train gets lost, you know? But it's not like I, I'm being facetious that my advice is so brilliant, but I think all of us who are experienced in our, in our different fields and our endeavors and professions, you know, you know, I've been through that experience where we're trying to guide some somebody junior along the path and take the benefit. And sometimes our advice doesn't work because everybody's got to work out their own path. But sometimes, you know, we know that, hey, these are the steps that everybody's got to do. So you please do them. And they don't. Okay. So time wise. Um, okay. Let me take a little bit more for, for uh, Dylan and then come back to Dogan. So let's go to shelter from the storm is from the Blood on the Tracks record. And this is, you know, a kind of a regretful song, probably about, uh, they say it's about Dylan's uh, divorce that happened a couple of years later, um, his breakup of his uh, ma first marriage. Um, it's got some very philosophical lines in it. Let's take, um, I, I think, um, Um, you know, I was, it was in another lifetime, one of toil and blood, blackness was a virtue of the world was full of mud. I was a creature void of form. I was burned out from exhaustion, buried in the hail. Um, now let's go back to that concept of doubt. You don't see this in Dogen as much, but in some of the um, uh, Zen writers in China, they would describe the doubt in great detail, like being a rat that's cornered and you know you're trapped, but you know, you, 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 and you know there's no escape. Um, they often used animal imagery here to, to kind of show how uh, when, you, when you feel that doubt, that despondency, that wintertime feeling, you know, you feel like trapped. Um, like uh, one example I like is when they say a dog, a dog smells this uh, oil uh, that's burning. And, it, you know, it smells good because there's some, um, you know, it's, it's, it's gonna to lead to some good food, but it's hot oil and the dog doesn't know enough not to lick the oil, even though it probably knows on some level and it licks the hot oil and gets burned. And that's kind of a level that we go through where we, we have those frustrations and futilities and, and we can't get past it. Um, now, 
that third verse I like, the deputy walks on hard nails and the preacher rides him out, but nothing merely matters, it's still alone that counts. A one-eyed undertaker blows a futile horn. Um, I, you know, I think this has a Zen flavor to it um, also. Um, any thoughts on that first line, the deputy on hard nails and the preacher rides him out? Would we, we, we expect the deputy to walk on hard nails? Who walks on hard nails usually? Saints. Right. And who, who rides them out? The apocalypse. Well, yeah, could be. Um, Cowboys. Cowboys and deputies, right? Sheriffs and deputies are in the old Western days would be riding them out, right? Um, There's and itinerant preachers also in the old West. And preachers could ride them out, but, and you know, that's a good point. But the way I took this is like, it's a, a kind of Zen reversal of the common sense thing. That when we say the deputy, we think of the writing, you know, that would be more associated with writing that. When we think of the preacher, not so much the preacher, but the, the, the religious practitioner, especially, you know, uh, the, I mean, the stereotype would be the, uh, the old fashioned yoga in India of like, uh, you know, self denial, self torture, torture the flesh to, to liberate the mind kind of idea. So you're kind of reversing the the religious figure and the secular figure and then saying um but but kind of doom the apocalypse oversees all that like nothing in the end and there there is some apocalyptic imagery in uh, in buddhism buddhist buddha had the fire sermon um uh there, there you know one of the koans it's not so well known today but was very famous back then is like what comes at the end of this eon and also what comes before this eon so there was a sense of, um, of, uh, of kind of the end of days and, and end time. Um, but the, the undertaker, you know, don't count, on, don't count me out. I think it, I interpret that third line is like, don't count me out. The undertaker is futile. I'm not going to die because of these pressures. I'm not going to die because of these role reversals and all of this. I'm going to, you know, and the, and the fact that doom is, is on the way. I still have to um, uh, take my... Um, my stand. Okay, so let's go back. Let's go back to page. Um, I think it's going to be page five. All right. Yeah, bottom of page five. Okay. So, final segment here. Gion verse and capping phrase comments. So, um, I'm sure many of you have read Genjo Koan and, and other fascicles and um, or will be reading them. And, uh, you know, I, in, in doing research on that in recent years, I realized one of the things that has gotten kind of lost in the shuffle or overlooked is that there were some commentaries written by followers of Dogen in those um, early, um, early years back in the um, 12, 1300s. Not that much was written because I think they had a sense like, hey, we don't want to touch Dogen. First of all, none of us understand it. <laughs> you know? uh, and, and we're not going to question it. Um, and we're just going to let it speak for itself. I think that, that was kind of their attitude. But uh, Gion, who was the fifth abbot of Aheji, um, uh, wrote uh, comments on a version of the Shobogenzo that had uh, 60 fascicles instead of a higher number of fascicles. That's a whole story in itself. But uh, Gion was born in 1253. So that was the year Dogen died. So it's interesting that, um, you know, that there was a slight overlap. Um, and um, he became a Zen monk. And um, he he joined the temple that was founded by Dogen, one of Dogen's followers. So one of Dogen's direct followers was a guy named Jacuin, who had come from China. He, he, a year after Dogen returned from China, this guy came to join Dogen. 
And um, when, Dogen, when Dogen died in 1253, Jacqueline, they say, spent 17 years sitting on a stone. Well, guess what he was doing on the stone for 17 years? What, what is he copying uh, the, Dogen's works? Uh, too active. Reading. Too passive. <laughs> I don't know. He was sitting Zazen. Awesome. Yes, of course. <laughs> For 17 years. They still have the stone. That um, It's located not that far from Meheji in the, in the kind of foresty area. And then um, there was a, uh, a cow and a dog that kind of looked out for him. And they protected him from any animals going to attack him. And apparently they kind of brought food over to him. And, uh, and those are enshrined. They have, they have little statues of the, of the cow and the, and the dog in that temple still today. And, um, and but he eventually, so a, a wealthy uh, patron came and found him and said, hey, you, you need your own temple. So they started a temple. And then uh, this was in 1280. Uh, and then by then, Guillaume was uh, 27, I guess. So he joined that temple. And then um, when Jacqueline died, he became head of that temple. And then in 1314, he moved back to Eheji. He moved over to Eheji. And they say that he really revolutionized Eheji because by now, you know, Dogen was, had been dead about uh, 60 years and things had kind of fallen apart. There had been a big fire. Uh, people hadn't kept up with the studies of Dogen. They weren't really paying attention to Shobo Genzo. And Gion is credited with reinvigorating the scene at that time. And he, he was really famous. He was like almost as famous as Dogen for a couple hundred years. But eventually, you know, that subsided and, and he's not very well known today, but historically he plays this role. And so what he did was he took uh, the fascicles, 60 fascicles, and he writes a verse on each of those fascicles. And he also writes um, a capping phrase. Okay, so in his version, uh, Genjo Koan was the number one fascicle. In Kaz Tanahashi's and some other versions, it appears usually, it often appears as the third fascicle because chronologically it was written third. But um, I think in those early days, they thought, well, this is the most important one. Um, and so we're going to put this first. <clears throat> and I think a lot of people would agree with that. So here I translate it as really realizing the koan in everyday life, realization here and now, actualizing the fundamental point. There's a lot of ways to translate this. Okay, capping phrase. So who would like to read the capping phrase? Uh, I could do it. I, I, you want me to start reading at the words fascicle one, Genjo Koan? Okay, go ahead. Fascicle one, Genjo Koan, realizing the Koan in everyday life. What is it? Do not overlook that which is right in front of you. The endless spring appears with the early plum blossoms. Using a single word, you can enter the open gate. Nine oxen pulling with all their might cannot lead you astray. Okay, thank you. Um, so, any thoughts? Well, let me start I off. Love, uh, oh, the, I love, I'm sorry, I just want to say, I love the endless spring and the early plum blossoms, which disappear so quickly. And I love that contrast in that line. Right. Um, okay, good. Um, so, uh, yeah, so to comment a little bit more on that, the uh, endless spring means, um, I mean, obviously spring ends every year, but it comes back every, uh, every year. So it's, in that sense, it's kind of, um, it, you know, each of the seasons has its own kind of e e endlessness or eternal quality to it. Um, and the plum blossoms, you know, if you go to, um, 
parts of China and Japan. The plum blossoms are the earliest blossoms to come out. And Dogen has a whole chapter called Plum Blossoms and he writes quite a bit about it. And uh, plum blossoms come out and, and there's still snow. Uh, you know, there may still be snow on the tree um, and, and the plum blossoms. And they're very fragrant blossoms, kind of intoxicating uh, fragrance. And so, yeah, that contrast or the, the complementarity. You know, one of the things Dogen says is like, Plum blossoms don't come because it's spring. Spring is here when there's plum blossoms. So uh, I think uh, Guillaume is trying to highlight that point. Okay, and how about um, the single word? Um, if I may comment, I think uh, the single word kind of reminds me of uh, uh, the monks who were enlightened from he, the monk that was enlightened from hearing the the pebble strike the bamboo, or from hearing the other monk, uh, you know, that saw the 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 plum the um, the cherry blossoms uh, springing. You know, you can have that that single uh, moment or that single uh, word that can uh, help you reach enlightenment. And at the same time, there could be uh, a thousand words that don't help you reach enlightenment. It's, it all depends on which one you know really resonates with you personally. Right. Good. Yeah, I mean, one, uh, you know, there was a famous uh, story where Bodhidharma, the first Zen teacher, uh, was trying to pick a successor, and he talked to four people, and he gave them answers, and Dogen said, well, look, if, if, he had, if six people had been there, he you know, he would, they would have had six conversations, and if hundreds of thousands of people had been there, he would have had hundreds of thousands of conversations. So you're right, there could be hundreds of thousands of words, but if it's not the right word, it, it, you know, if you don't hit that right, you know, if the, if the sparks don't fly from the, rubbing the twigs together, it's never going to happen. But if, if the right word happens, uh, then the gate, the gate is there. And the gate, you know, it's the gateless gate. So the gate is not a gate. The gate is, is that false uh, obstruction that we, that we interpose between us and, and the Genjo Koan. Um, and, and when we, we get that uh, determination, uh, the ox you know, cannot, cannot affect us. Um, so, um, you know, nothing's going to take us away from getting, uh, getting through the, the gate if we see ruts right in front of our eyes. So, you know, I like to contrast this one with the Muso Soseki uh, poem. One other thing about this one, the capping phrase, what is it? So uh, that's, that's a question. If you look at the, the Chinese, the grammar, you know, it's clearly a question. What is it? But I think, and um, that Guillaume's intention here in following what Dogen often does in interpreting some of the koans is not to say what is it, but, and this is the, this is the, uh, I keep looking, I just want to make sure we're uh, time-wise. Uh, this is the, um, Uh, this is the big question. This is the crescendo question. <laughs> how, thinking of uh, Dogen, uh, how might we legitimately retranslate this, these three words? Doesn't seem like there's a lot of wiggle room on a certain level, but I think there is an important point here. Any, any thoughts, any wild guesses? I would say, um, how is it? How, how is it? How is it? Okay. Which uh, takes it away from what being kind of dual. An object. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. to more of a state of mind or a state of being. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How, how am I? How am I? Um, I think the... Um, I, I like that, except that you know, in the in the Chinese, it's it's an it. Um, so that would that would change it a little bit. But I think um, I have something. I think those are good suggestions. But I have something a little more drastic in mind. How about who? Um, yeah, I mean the it's kind of open ended what that interrogative is. <laughs> who or how? 
but you're personalizing it. You're making it about the experience. You're making it subjective yeah. rather than ob the object. So those are good, but even How more. Who's good. on first? Pardon me? Who's on first? <laughs> Where uh, is it? More drastic. Is it? Closer. This is it. This is it, yes. Mm -hmm. In other words, it doesn't have to be a question. Mm -hmm. Like if we said, what is it? But if we, if we said, instead of it, we use this. This is what? And I think Dogen does this on a number of occasions where he turns a question into a statement. So what are you thinking about when you do Zazen? This is what you were thinking about when you were doing Zazen. I mean, uh, you know, go through some of the other passages in Dogen and he, you know, the translations don't always reflect that subtlety, even if the, I think the new, you know, when, when the Stanford translation comes out uh, with all the footnotes, you know, the, it'll, it'll show some of this, but, um, but mostly the translators are trying to, you know, make it readable and presentable so they can't, they can't take too much uh, license with it. But I think what Dogen often does is turn the question into a statement. And so it would be legitimate to say, this is it. You know, Gonjo Kowan is right here. It's not a question. The question is the answer. Um, it is what it is. That's what Genjo Koan. I mean, Genjo Koan means you're looking right in front of your eyes and you're seeing for the first time. You're seeing the earthworms, you're seeing the butterflies, you're seeing the spider webs. Uh, maybe, you, maybe you were attentive to them before, but now you're seeing them, but not, the, not just the physical seeing, that, that dharmic insight. Um, I, I kind of feel like the question or statement, uh, what is it? or it is what uh, relates to the fourth, I'm sorry, the third line, using a single word. Yeah. I see that as the uh, response or parallel to it. Right, so what is that single word? Could be, the single word could be, you know, what? What is the single word? What, what is that word? Mm -hmm. You know, the I, word I, is what? I was trying to say that, uh, the single word is, what is it? Okay. I, I have a question. Yeah. Would, would what is this be a mistranslation? Um, no. Um, what is this could be, yeah, because that, uh, that character is, you know, could be this or it could be it. So, uh, yeah, maybe that's better. Maybe that's better. What is this? And then if I want to reverse it, or if you want to reverse it, make it, this is, this is, this is what it is. I mean, one thing, if you, if you get a little linguistically philosophical here, people talk about the whatness, you know, the quid, quiddity of something. You know, if you go back to kind of, uh, you know, uh, Roman uh, philosophy, they would talk, you know, the what is, is the essence of something. Something's, you know, essence isn't a great word to use in, in Buddhism necessarily, but the, the true meaning of something, the true dharmic uh, insight into something is the whatness of it. You know, what is that butterfly? The butterfly is what it is. But, you know, you know it when you see it, but you can't really put it into words. A single word might tip you off, but a single word might, you know, a thousand words might lead you astray. There's, okay, good. There's... Let's do one last one. Next page, please. Okay, so um, okay, let, let's do number eleven. Uh, just scroll down a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Before you go on, could you yeah. ask uh, um, when is the Stanford um, translation coming out? <laughs> yeah, um, it's on the way. I um, I sometimes tell the story that. Um, you know, they've had a more or less complete translation for a while. And I was sent a couple of years ago, a 2000 page uh, word document with the complete translation and all the footnotes and all the, um, 
or the original Japanese in 10 point uh, font. And I, I got that file and my laptop was uh, being funky for a couple of days anyway. And I tried to do a search in that 2000 page file on it and it, it cr completely crashed the laptop. And I had a um, scramble because I was leaving for Japan in two days and I had to buy a new laptop and all this stuff. So I was kind of uh, <laughs> a little frustrated, but I was so happy to have that version. Uh, it's not something, you know, that's being shared outside of a, a small group, but I'm not sure, you know, they're, they're such uh, um, perfectionists in doing this, you know, and working on it for so many years. And I think one of the things that happened was that, and it's, it has some amazing stuff, but they have so many footnotes. And I think one thing that happened was they would, you know, as they did each fascicle, they would build up these footnotes. But then, of course, a lot of times those footnotes duplicated another fascicle. You know, so every time you refer to Rujing, you know, do you redefine, you know, do you define who Rujing was? That's how they developed the fascicles one by one. And so that was one of the things they wanted to go back and edit. And I think they're also, you know, on the wording is sometimes so um, ambiguous, you know, so they're going back and with the footnotes. So I don't know. It's hard for me to say. I mean, it, it, when I talked to them in 2018, they promised it would be out in 2020. But here we are in 2020. And so I don't want to keep uh, bugging, but I think, you know, the other thing is it's going to be a massive uh, project. So last I heard, you know, it was going to be at least seven, eight, maybe nine volumes. And I, I think, you know, getting the publisher lined up and, you know, I don't know what the logistics are, the economics are, how many people are going to be able to access it. Um, so uh, but it, you know, it will kind of revolutionize things. You know, it, it had been available on a website, as some of you know, um, and it was around 2018 when they took down that website, so you can't access it. But I think Carl Bielefeld, who's a very generous guy, uh, has been known to respond to people by sending them versions of particular fascicles. So if, if somebody has a request of some particular fascicle, um, you know, my understanding is that he would be willing, or he has in the past been willing to, uh, uh, to send that out <clears throat> and, um, and, and someday the whole thing will come. Okay. So final thing, um, Zazen Gi, principles of Zazen, flowers blooming on a withered tree is the capping phrase. Okay. This is a typical saying that Dogen uses and and Dongshan uses it. And, you know, what does flowers blooming on a withered tree mean? Insight. I think it's insight. Insight? Yeah, you're sitting there and suddenly a flower blooms. Yeah. Okay, insight during the, the you know, after the, after the winter time. In the, in the midst of the winter time, in the midst of the dark cave, in the midst of the delusion, and then the insight comes. Um, of course, there's a cyclical quality because the withered trees are going to lead to flowers in that eternal springtime, too. You know, but, uh, you know, it's interesting because in modern uh, China, um, can anybody guess what this phrase, flowers blooming on a withered tree, means in contemporary uh, Chinese society? It sounds a lot like um, uh, autumn spring romance. Yes. Uh, or it's, uh, yeah, uh, it, well, it, it's actually more, uh, and yes, it's romance. So it's basically anytime, um, you know, somebody has their heart broken and then uh, they meet somebody. <laughs> so, you know, maybe there's a Zen meeting embedded in that as well, but. Um, uh, I think there's very much an aspect of the unexpected uh, suddenly manifesting itself. Yes, that's a good way to put it. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. I mean, it, it even looks like something impossible. A withered tree does not put forth flowers. Right. It will uh, if, the, if the springtime comes and the plum blossoms. But on the withered tree, it's, a, it's like an impossibility. Yeah. That's true. But yet, um, it... Uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, we could say flowers will bloom on a withered tree, you know, but they don't have those tenses in the original language there. So, um, 
you know, but yes, I think all those meetings are important. And then Can I um, add one. Yes. Um, it seems like, you know, expression of hope, just when you think that nothing more is possible, right. suddenly something will emerge. Um, exactly. Um, exactly. Suddenly it emerges. Suddenly that insight comes. Suddenly that hope, hope springs eternal. Suddenly uh, something flourishes where it didn't seem like anything could flourish before. Um, and um, actually, you know, connected with the next one, the dragon's how, because um, are people familiar? Are you guys familiar with the image of the dragon's, the dragon's how or the dragon's roar or the dragon's sound? Um, the way Dogen uses it, the way it's used in Zen and Dogen. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a whole fascicle on that. So, you know, one idea is that the, that, you know, in, in the Chinese worldview, in the traditional Chinese worldview, you know, dragons and, and um, other powerful uh, kind of mythical beings are kind of lurking in the environment everywhere. And you try to unlock that energy. And uh, dragons, which are generally, uh, you know, uh, auspicious and mean something good is happening and they protect the Dharma and they protect sutras and they, and they can protect the truth, but they can also obviously be threatening and, and uh, powerful against you. Um, dragons appear uh, when people are doing good zazen. And they give off this how, because they're content. Now, the, the word how, I've tried to look into this, and it's like, because uh, a lot of people translate as how or roar, but, you know, another interpretation is just like, it's just like they're breathing. It's just like dragons are contentedly breathing, and there's like a subtle sound. And they breathe in a kind of musical way, pentatonic scales. Um, and those people who are doing zazen such that flowers are blooming on that withered tree can hear the how, of the, can hear that subtle sound the dragons are giving forth. And they know that that's a kind of reinforcement of, of, um, of uh, you know, of, 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 the, of the situation that they're in. And it's kind of an acknowledgement that uh, their, their, uh, their practice is in tune. And so in that, in Fascicle 51 there, and it says like, um, keeping harmony and balance with each tone who dares encroach on the process of fine tuning it. So, you, you know, once you hear that dragon's sound, it has its own rhythm, it has its own balance, it, it's reflecting the harmony within you and the environment. Um, you know, don't, don't question it, don't fine tune it, you know? So one thing is if you face that wall and you have to like kind of step back and, and sit again, you know? But another question is if you're doing it right, like, you know, I guess don't, what do they say? Don't, uh, if, it ain't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, okay, so, um, how are we doing time-wise? I think it's... Um... We are uh, 10 minutes over. Okay. Ish. Ish. Um, okay. So, uh, well, I think, um, shall we stop here then? Um... It's been great, Stephen. I, I just can't thank you enough. And I want to do this all the time. Okay. <laughs> It yes. must be exhausting for you, uh, but uh, it's, it's really just very, very enlightening. Terrific. Well, thank you. I, um, I appreciate the opportunity. Like I think Howard said, you know, Griff, Griff Folk said, you know, it, it's like being in a candy shop, right? When you have all these people <laughs> interested in, in Dogen. And uh, so, you know, this is what we, uh, we live for. It's so rich. It is so incredibly rich. I took a lot of notes and uh, hoping you'll come back with more. Yes. Uh, uh, sounds good. That's uh, great. Yeah, I'm eager to do it. So I know I'll see you in the uh, summer anyway, but hopefully uh, maybe sometime. Well, 
well, it'd be great if you could come back. We would love it. Okay. Yeah. We just love it. Look at everybody nodding. <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much. Uh,